I need to give a quick preface to this video, because I filmed this originally back in 2018. I was in South Africa at the time, and uh, Tony Neofitu, the designer of the Strike machine gun, gave me the opportunity to film his working prototype, with the acknowledgement that I would hold on to that video until such time as that prototype had been a little further developed and it was really ready for publicity, but he was willing to let me film it from a historical perspective as the prototype. Now, at the time, he was developing this under contract with Denel Land Systems, the predominant small arms manufacturer in South Africa. In the intervening couple of years, Denel Land Systems has gone through a financial upheaval. I think the, the technical like financial forensics term is massive dumpster fire, and it is a complete shambles, and uh, the production contract is gone. So at the current time, this is actually a design that has continued to see some refinement. In fact, he also has a second generation of the shoulder-fired uh, version that he's working on separately. But this is a design that currently is not under production by anybody, and frankly, uh, the designer would be interested in finding someone who would be interested in producing it. So uh, if Tony Neofitu is watching this, he will cringe probably when I say this, because he's a very humble uh, gentleman, but he is a brilliant small arms designer. Uh, has a fantastic body of work that I think equals or exceeds virtually any other small arms designer alive today, and I think he is criminally underappreciated in South Africa. So if you happen to have a factory and you're looking for something like this, get in touch with me and I would be happy to put you in touch with him. Now, on to the actual video on the strike. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum and I am here today taking a look at a prototype of what I think is actually a really conceptually interesting new machine gun designed by a fellow by the name of Tony Neofitu, who is uh, probably most recognized for uh, a shotgun called the Neosted 2000, and also a sort of hybrid rifle grenade launcher called the PAWS, uh, or the Neopop, the Personal Assault Weapon System. At any rate, uh, what we have here is something that's intended to sort of bridge the gap between a, a 7.62 caliber machine gun and a 40 millimeter automatic grenade launcher. So the idea of, well, you're of course familiar with the 7.62 machine guns, and this is intended to stay in basically the same sort of size and weight envelope as a 7.62 general purpose machine gun. So this weighs right about 13 kilograms, that's so 26, 28 pounds, um, which is a little heavy for a gun that's this size, but what it, what it loses in weight, it makes up for in capability. Uh, it is, by the way, a lot uh, lighter, less than half the weight of a typical uh, grenade machine gun, a 40 millimeter automatic grenade launcher. However, this is an automatic grenade launcher. This is firing the 20 by 42 uh, 20 millimeter cartridge. And that's the same cartridge that's used in the Neopup, which is a shoulder fired grenade launcher. The idea here is to get basically a um, a supporting weapon using that cartridge. So um, the advantages that it has over a typical 40 millimeter grenade launcher are primarily in uh, volume, you know, the, the size uh, package of the whole unit, and also in velocity and ballistics. So this thing has a muzzle velocity of about 310 meters per second. That's right about a thousand feet per second, which is a lot faster than a typical 40 millimeter grenade. Uh, low pressure or the dual high low pressure 40 millimeter stuff. And what that gives you is a much better ballistic situation. Uh, it's far flatter shooting and it has a far lower uh, actual travel time. One of the issues of shooting a 40 millimeter grenade at long range militarily is that it takes a substantial amount of time. We're talking three to five seconds to actually get to its destination. And stuff moves a considerable amount in three to five seconds. This is more like a one second flight time for a, you know, a medium to long range engagement. And that allows a much better solution for direct fire. Um, it fires about 400 rounds a minute. And so, you know, a three round burst of this with high explosive 20 millimeter can in many ways give a better solution to a, a military problem than a GPMG would. 
for example, um, shooting at vehicles, 20 millimeter rounds like this, these are dummies by the way, um, are going to have much more effect on a vehicle than just 30 caliber bullets. Uh, if you have a situation where, say, there's like there's two guys with an RPG inside that building, you know, a little one-room building, or somewhere in that room, and we can see the window. Well, with a machine gun, you kind of have to just search around, shoot a bunch, you know, through the walls, through the door, and see if you can maybe, by chance, hit a target that you can't see. Whereas with high explosive, this is an area impact projectile. You put a couple rounds through the window, or through the door, or through the wall. And it's going to be really bad news for anybody who's inside that room. So that's the goal here, is to have a much higher level of effective fire without having to be able to see the target um, and in a very small portable package. So uh, this is still in its prototype phase. Uh, in fact, I'm filming this quite a long time before you guys are seeing it because um, the designer wanted it to be a little more refined before it was you know, published out to the world. There's a lot of really cool stuff going on inside this gun that makes it possible to have a really highly destructive weapon in a very small package. So let's take a look at all of those, uh, well, how exactly this thing works. All right, so conceptually, there are a lot of things going on in this that aren't typical of a machine gun. For one thing, very short little barrel here, um, like 14 inches total. And the reason for that is this is a, a cartridge that has a very heavy projectile and a very low powder charge, relatively speaking, certainly compared to any typical uh, rifle cartridge. So just for comparison's sake, this is the actual projectile. So the cartridge case itself is only 42 millimeters long. Um, and we have a muzzle velocity of about 1,000 feet per second. Uh, bullet weight here, projectile weight, this is a standard like the, the, the equal to the US 20 millimeter uh, Vulcan projectile. It's like 110 grams, which is something in grains. I'll have to check on that. But it is a, a hollow projectile, high explosive core or armor piercing incendiary. A lot of interesting and exciting payloads that can be put into that. One of the things that struck me as really interesting about this is the whole reason that development even began on this was because of the existence of these belts. Uh, this gun can actually use either NSV or DSHK belts because this cartridge is the same profile as the Russian 14.5 uh, that those belts, or the Russian 50, I'm sorry, that those belts were designed for. And what that meant is that it wasn't necessary to design a feeding device, even though uh, there was what was effectively a new cartridge being used in the gun. And so, uh, you know, that's out there I think I've probably said this elsewhere before, but designing feeding devices is far harder than actually designing firearms. And had it not been for the existence of a fully functional and well-developed feeding device, this thing would have never existed in the first place. All right, so if we look at the gun itself, um, we have a big folding, non-reciprocating charging handle on the side. The size is important there because this does have a relatively stiff pair of springs in it. Uh, and you want to be able to get a good solid grip on this thing to actually charge the gun. Then the top is basically all top cover. Push in the button, we can pop that open. There's also a feed tray that can be opened up. And what we have here is one of the really cool elements of this thing. So let's take a closer look at that. So if you look at these two horns, for lack of a better term, um, they're there to guide the belt and they are also there to actually de-link the cartridges because they start narrow here and they get wider as they go back. In fact, you can see this curved path right here. That's the, the path that each cartridge is going to take. So when I have a belt, it's going to sit like this. You can see the belt sits on top of these horns. And as it feeds in, we're going to get a cartridge right there. And now the, these two horns are actually coming in between the link and the cartridge itself. And as this is pulled inward by the feed pawl, it's going to force the cartridge to pop downward out of the link and onto the, into the feedway. So this takes a little bit of force and it's normally done by the gun. We'll touch on that in a second. But when you pull the belt in, it's going to pop the round out of the link. Just like that. Now we can go ahead and take the belt out and you can see exactly what's happened in there. There's a release lever right here to allow me to remove the belt. And now 
you can see that there's a cartridge sitting in the feedway. Now what's cool about this system is all of that work has been done when the bolt is going rearward, and that's not really that common in machine guns. What this means is that the work of lifting the belt, and by the way, as a belt full of 20 millimeter ammo, it's really quite heavy, and the force required to delink the cartridges, all of that's do being done by the powered stroke rearward of the action. So using the recoil energy from the succeeding shot, or the preceding shot, uh, the barrel recoils backward, and that's what gives the energy to do all this. More typically in machine guns, you'll often find um, the belt lifting being done on the return stroke of the barrel, uh, which is powered only by the recoil spring. So this is a pretty cool setup. One cool little detail in this is that there's a little flat spring right here, and that's there for a very specific purpose. Namely, I can lift up the feed tray, and that cartridge is held in place on the feed tray by that little spring. Without it, you would be in this situation, which happens on some other designs, where when you have this one round sitting here ready to go, if you try and open the gun up, this round just kind of falls out and gets in the way. Well, in this case, it's held nicely in place, and if you want to take it out, it just uh, pops right out. All right, a few other basic functional, main functional elements of the gun. We have the feed pulse system here, which is run by this bearing. Of course, as it cycles left and right, it's going to pull a cartridge in, and this is a not, not atypical for belt-fed machine gun. There is an extra uh, pull in here, which is necessitated basically just because of the size of the cartridges in this thing. And that bearing is operated by this cam track right down in here. So as the bolt itself goes forward and back, it's going to cycle the feed system left and right. As for the overall mechanical system, it is kind of a long short recoil. So I would define this as short recoil, uh, but it's a longer stroke than you would typically find on short recoil. So when you fire, the whole barrel reciprocates back. You can see that that cycles the feed system. Uh, and then, well, let's go ahead and pull the internals out and you can see exactly what's going on. There is a set of spade grips at the back and a thumb trigger right here. Disassembly begins by actually opening the top cover and the feed tray. Put those up. And then there is one captive pin holding on the grip assembly. Pull that out. The grip assembly pivots down. And then we have two recoil springs. This is the recoil spring for the barrel assembly. Remember, this is a recoil operated gun. So there has to be some way for the barrel to reciprocate independently of the bolt. So that's the barrel spring. And then we have the longer and heavier uh, bolt recoil spring. Next up, and this is a pretty cool idea. Next up, the trigger assembly comes out. Uh, and this is actually a detachable trigger assembly. So we'll get to exactly how this works in a moment. All right, and then, of course, the bolt and the barrel assembly. So we're gonna lock this and just open it nice and briskly. That unlocks the bolt, so we can take that out. And then the barrel and bolt carrier assembly all come out. All right, so on the bolt here, uh, we have a couple things going on. We have a lever here that recocks the firing pin. We have our trigger right here, actually. Um, there is a lever inside the receiver that trips this uh, when the bolt goes forward so that it can't fire until it's actually in battery. Um, however, this does fire from an open bolt, which means we have a system where there is a sear right here that locks into this surface on the back of the bolt. So that hooks together like so. And then when you push in the thumb trigger, you're going to depress this trigger. That's your actual manual firing trigger. And then this one is basically the auto sear. And when these are in, it allows this sear to be depressed. So, there we go. So when that gets, I, I say depressed, but it's actually moving upward inside the gun, that releases the bolt and allows the gun to fire. Now, the reason there are two big springs on here is because the recoil impulse of this thing in 20 by 42 <laughs> uh, created uh, so much energy that it was actually damaging these components uh, if they weren't buffered. So 
these springs allow the whole trigger mechanism to cycle forward and backward just a little bit. And that takes the shock loading off of the sear and allows it to be a much more durable design. Now the auto sear is, has a little more going on. There's a lever right here inside the, the side of the receiver. I've got this on that side right now. This uh, is articulated by the bolt when the bolt goes forward. Then on the trigger frame, we have this lever. And when the bolt is forward, this goes down, which pushes this surface forward, which engages with the auto sear. If I can get this held in place, the auto sear right there. So this is a, a whole series of connections to ensure that the gun, when firing in full auto, doesn't actually discharge until the bolt is all the way closed and in battery. And that brings up the next question, which is, how does it actually lock? All right, so on our bolt carrier, or uh, actually you'd probably call this a barrel extension, and it does have some definite uh, reminiscent uh, elements of the Browning 1919 system, including a vertically traveling locking block right here. There's a lockout right here. So I have to push this, this little lever in in order to get the locking block to lift. And the reason for that is the locking block is always being pushed upwards, and it, this lock prevents it from dragging on the bottom of the bolt. So instead, when the bolt uh, moves ju forward just enough uh, for it to lock, this is pressed in, the locking block comes up, and that locking block engages right here behind the back of the bolt, and that's what uh, keeps the whole thing in battery when it fires. So from this locked position, when the gun fires, recoil will move this whole barrel extension backwards, and then we have a little angled surface right here, and it's a little difficult to see, but right here we have a pair of hooks, one there and one there, that uh, interact with that angled surface, and when the barrel extension starts moving backwards, these pull that locking block downward, unlock it, the barrel extension then reaches the limit of its travel, it stops, and the bolt is able to continue moving backwards uh, under the momentum that it already has. Now, of course, you want some sort of system to prevent that barrel extension from just slamming into the back of the receiver on every shot. And so there are two uh, spring buffers right here, and they're actually built into the barrel extension itself. Uh, and those will impact on basically the trigger frame assembly, which is why it is securely uh, connected to the back of the receiver. And that's what dampens the impact of, uh, of the barrel extension on each shot. All right, for an open bolt gun, there's actually quite a lot going on here in the actual firing cycle. So we're going to start with, if we just trace the trigger process backwards, uh, in the bolt itself, oh, there's the bolt face, this button is the trigger. So if I push that down, there we go, that drops the firing pin, now protrudes out there, and you can see that this little cam is now lifted up. Uh, this is the lever that recocks the firing pin. So this typically happens, well obviously it happens when the gun, uh, when all of these parts are moving forward. Because this fires from an open bolt, its starting position is with the bolt back here. So the bolt comes forward and that pin is going to be triggered by this lever right there. So this lifts up like so that fires the gun. Now, what causes that to lift up? Well, that is done by this little block inside the receiver. This hits that lever, pulls it up, and fires the gun. This is also a safety mechanism. So you can see that moving. If we look at the outside here, this is actually connected to a big handle, a big lever with a handle. What this allows you to do is drop that block out of the path of the bolt, which means nothing can fire because the trigger will never actually be tripped. Uh, even if you pull the trigger in the back of the gun, the thumb trigger, um, the, the, this interrupts the firing mechanism that goes through the action. So while this isn't really technically a safety, it is a safety, uh, meaning that when you deactivate it like this, you can then cycle the gun, open the top cover, clear a malfunction, load the gun, unload the gun, anything you want to do while having guaranteed that it definitely can't go off in the process. So that's the fire position. That's the not fire position. 
Now there's one more cool little detail built into this thing. Um, first off, because this is fired, we have this lever that has to be pushed down back into the bolt in order to recock the firing pin. And that actually takes quite a lot of force. Now, when you're actually shooting, there is this surface built into the barrel extension, and as the bolt travels backwards out of that, that angled surface is going to force it to recock. So that's how the gun actually functions when you're shooting. However, what if you do a stupid thing like I've just done and you release the firing pin while you've got the bolt out of the gun? This is kind of like, you know, dropping the, uh, <laughs> the locking block on a G3 while you've got the thing out of the gun. Now you're stuck and you have to pull it back out before you can reassemble the gun. However, that was thought of. So there's this angled surface right here. And even if I have the bolt uncocked, that surface will depress this lever uh, so that I can just reassemble the gun even if I don't have it in the right configuration. So put that in and then I need to close the bolt all the way like so. And then presto, gun is reassembled even though I was an idiot and decocked it while the bolt was removed. You might be wondering what this lug is. That's actually the front, uh, basically the receiving point for the, the yeah. bolt's main spring uh, remember that this is a prototype example of the gun. So uh, by the time you're seeing this, the, the uh, more production level versions actually have this integrated fully into the bolt instead of being a separate added on uh, piece there. We also have this spring loaded arm. Uh, this is what picks up a cartridge from the feed tray and uh, loads it into the chamber. It's spring loaded to ensure that uh, you can still pull a cartridge down even if the bolt's in the forward position. And I think it's also important to point out that this uses the controlled feed uh, principle like Mauser rifles, where uh, as the cartridge begins to feed, it slots in underneath the extractor. And what that ensures is that you don't ever get a situation where you, it basically ensures that you don't have a double feed. So if something goes wrong, you know that you're not going to have one cartridge trying to get pushed up into the primer of a cartridge that's already in the chamber, because the only way that the bolt can pick one up uh, well, the bolt picks up the cartridge as soon as it starts to feed. So if there's one in the chamber, there can't be a second one picked up. So one aspect of this feed system that is a little bit unusual is this additional pawl at the far end. And this is there to control, to prevent over travel of the link, basically. And you can see there's a cammed surface here that lifts this up. Now remember, this thing fires from a closed bolt, and one of its ideal applications, for example, would be a vehicular mount. So if you are driving around in a vehicle and you've got a belt full of ammo, the, the bolt's open, so there's not really anything controlling where the belt is except for these two poles. So with the bolt open, this is held in the, the left-hand position like this, and those two poles directly control this rib on the back of the belt, and that prevents the ammunition belt from moving anywhere or getting out of position while, say, a vehicle is bouncing around driving. So the gun's always ready to actually fire, even if it's been jostled quite a lot. All right, so from an overall perspective, we have the gun by itself. Fold down the charging handle. Lock the bolt open like that. It is, of course, simpler when it's actually on a mount uh, instead of sliding around a table. Fold the handle up, and then you've got your thumb trigger back here, and it fires from an open bolt like that. So the thumb trigger is back here. It's just a very simple press-in trigger. Um, this is, of course, designed for use from a tripod or a vehicular mount. Uh, I think there are potential uses for this as a bipod-mounted weapon. Um, the designer did actually experiment with a pistol grip mount, uh, a shoulder stock pistol grip mount instead of this. Uh, but at this point in its development, working on, on getting the gun functional first rather than um, ancillary things like bipods and pistol grips. There are of course no sights on this at the moment because it is a, you know, a functional developmental prototype. There is a Picatinny rail on it, however, so you can mount whatever sort of electro-optical sight uh, you prefer. Note that this rail is on the fixed receiver, not actually on the top cover. And then of course you can see that this thing is all held together by cap screws. That's again because it is a developmental gun. So the final production version, uh, this would all be welded or uh, riveted together. But those screws make it very handy to take the gun apart and make changes to it uh, internally. 
So hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. It was definitely a privilege to be able to get my hands on this uh, as a prototype like this and be able to take a look at it. I think it's actually a really interesting and, and exciting concept. Not the sort of thing I've actually seen elsewhere before. Um, I'm not really familiar with anything else that quite fits this niche. And I hope that it's something that uh, some military power does decide to actually invest in. Um, I think it'd be pretty cool to see this not just actually adopted, but then also be able to go through um, you know, a series of use and development and improvement, that whole cycle, and see what it can really turn into. So, anyway, uh, if you enjoy seeing this on the net, please do consider signing up to help support the channel directly. It's you guys that make it possible for me to travel to uh, places far from home and find very cool guns like this one and bring them to you. Thanks for watching.